Who was Aristotle? Aristotle was a prominent philosopher in ancient Greece, and his ideas had a widespread influence on Western philosophy. Aristotle was one of the most important philosophers of ancient Greece, and arguably one of the most influential thinkers of all time. He was active during the fourth century BC as a scientist and polymath who made significant contributions to various fields. But perhaps his most celebrated concepts are those he made during his study of ethics, logic, and knowledge. This article is a brief introduction to his life and work. Aristotle was Alexander the Great's teacher. Aristotle was born in Stagira, a city in ancient Macedonia, now part of modern-day Greece. He came from a well-educated family, and at a young age, he moved to Athens to study under the renowned philosopher Plato at his academy. Aristotle spent around 20 years at the academy as a student and later as a teacher. After leaving Athens, Aristotle became the tutor of a young prince named Alexander, who later became Alexander the Great. The significance of this period and how much influence Aristotle had on Alexander's career as a military commander and a political leader isn't clear. What we do know is that Aristotle would have educated Alexander in a range of subjects, including philosophy, politics, and natural science. This pedagogic relationship lasted for several years until Alexander ascended to the throne. He founded his own school. Following his time with Alexander, Aristotle returned to Athens and founded his own school, known as the Lyceum. It became a prominent center of learning, and Aristotle lectured on various subjects, including philosophy, biology, physics, and ethics. This period can be seen as Aristotle putting the scientific principles he had developed the theoretical basis of into practice. He was a particularly prominent biologist, collected specimens, and wrote extensively on the subject during this period. Get the latest articles delivered to your inbox, Aristotle on Ethics. In the context of ethics, Aristotle is one of only two philosophers who has a major branch named for them, the other being Immanuel Kant. Aristotelian ethics is concerned above all with answering two questions. What does it mean to live a good life and what qualities should a person have in order to do so? Aristotle developed many ethical concepts. The idea of practical wisdom and the concept of flourishing remain particularly important. Moreover, his approach to ethics has been revived in the past three quarters of a century and now exerts an exceptionally broad influence on modern day ethicists. Aristotle on logic and knowledge. Aristotle's treatment of logic was similarly novel, extensive, and for well over 2,000 years, broadly seen as definitive. Immanuel Kant, writing at the turn of the 19th century, held that Aristotle had discovered all that there was to discover about the subject. That is no longer thought to be true, but even developments in modern logic owe much to Aristotle's pursuit of the logical structure of languages and his attempt to represent arguments in such a way as to avoid some of the ambiguities and misunderstandings caused by natural languages. Theory of Knowledge Aristotle's theory of knowledge was a version of empiricism, which is the idea that what we know, we know through our senses. Now, something like this was undoubtedly held by previous philosophers. Protagoras seems to have been one. The suggestion we get from earlier discussions of empiricism was that empiricist theories were intrinsically reductionist, limiting our capacity to explain the world in sophisticated and extensive ways. Aristotle's distinctive contribution lies partly in his development of a sophisticated, extensive, and pointedly non-reductive conception of things, and a similarly extensive relationship between things and our capacity to know them, even taking empiricism as his epistemological framework, that is, his theory of knowledge. What did Aristotle say about the mind? How does Aristotle conceive of the mind? And what are the problems with his conception? How does Aristotle define psychology? How far is the definition adopted by Aristotle from how psychology is defined today? This article will focus on those parts of Aristotle's psychology which overlap with our modern conception of the discipline. Certain issues to do with separating the mind from the body are discussed, after which the article focuses on Aristotle's theory of perception. Having raised one problem with this theory, Aristotle's conception of our faculty of understanding is then explored, and parallels with his theory of perception are raised. This article concludes with a discussion of the relationship between Aristotle's psychology and his empiricism, and some parallels with the problems facing more modern empiricist philosophies. Aristotle and Modern Psychology
What is psychology for Aristotle? It is worth stressing that what we call Aristotle's psychology actually includes a far broader field of investigation than modern-day psychology. Psychology for Aristotle is, above all, the investigation of the soul. The mind is, in effect, a part of the soul. And the soul is not just an entity, but also the principle by which all the processes of life are structured, meaning that there is no effective limit to what we can call psychological investigations in the Aristotelian scheme. In short, psychology, on one definition, constitutes the study of life itself, of its organizing principles. This article is concerned not just with setting out Aristotle's conception of the soul, but with those elements of Aristotle's psychology that approximately correspond to a more modern conception of psychology. In other words, this article is concerned with what Aristotle has to say about the mind. Beyond this, there is a tendency in Aristotle to vacillate on the question of if and how far the study of the mind and the soul is a proper subject of natural science. On the one hand, Aristotle thinks that the sentimental aspect of our mental lives is self-evidently bound up with certain physical processes. They are intractable from the rest of our body, which is a proper subject of inquiry for the natural sciences. Yet at the same time, the intellect, our faculty of understanding, may well not be entirely like the rest of the body. Aristotle is genuinely torn as to how to treat our psychology, which methods are best applied to it, and so on. It is commonplace to observe that Aristotle's own apparent indecision mirrors that which has come to define the study of the mind in philosophy. Separating the mind and body. The problem, simply put, is that attempts to separate the mind from the body seem to offer us incomplete descriptions. Yet so too do those attempts to naturalize our mental lives. That is, treat them as though they were entirely a part of the body like any other. This ambiguity is characteristic of Aristotle's conception of the relationship between the mind and body. The element of the mind that Aristotle pays the most attention to is one which arguably has led much of the subsequent discussion of the relationship between mind and body. Perception. Perception is what distinguishes animals from plants. The most basic sense which all animals possess is touch. Most animals have access to at least some other senses as well. The standard interpretation of Aristotle's theory of how perception actually comes about is summarized by the following quote from De Anima, Aristotle's treatise on the soul. Perception comes about within organs being changed and affected, for it seems to be a kind of alteration. For Aristotle, the essence of perception is firmly rooted in the change that one entity exerts on a composite. Part of the point of a theory of perception is to say not just how it works, but what perception is. Indeed, it is uncontroversial to suggest that what something is has a lot to do with how it works, or how the larger system or entity of which it is an element works. One way in which subsequent philosophers have criticized Aristotle's theory of perception hinges on his focus on the organ of perception rather than perception in itself. In other words, it hinges on his failure to properly explain what perception is rather than just how it works. The question arises, what distinguishes the kind of alteration that a sense organ undergoes as a result of the effect of the stimulus upon it versus that of some non-sensory organ, or indeed some other composite entity that can be altered by that same stimulus? The problem of perception. The answer to the question of what perception is seems rather obvious. When a sense organ is altered, then perception results. When other organs or entities are altered, perception does not result. Well, quite. But what is perception then? We haven't actually said what it is, but rather appear to have skirted around the question by saying what causes it. Perhaps if perception was the kind of thing about which any possible confusion is trivial or unimportant, then this wouldn't be such a problem. But of course, there is a great deal of disagreement among philosophers concerning what constitutes perception. Perception cannot be limited to the five senses of touch, sight, taste, hearing and smell, even in principle. Some philosophers like David Hume and John Locke speak about our having inner perceptions, perceptions of or about our own minds, and such subcategories of perception tend to overlap uncomfortably with the five senses. Describing perception necessarily requires clarifying further philosophical issues. What exactly is the difference between seeing an object and picturing it in our minds? What if we mistake an instance of the latter for one of the former? To be clear, 
Aristotle's theory of perception is not this straightforward, but it does certainly put the alteration of an organ at the very forefront of his conception of it. On the understanding and the mind, having addressed the perceptive element of the soul, what does Aristotle have to say about our faculty of understanding or mind, nous? For starters, describing nous as a faculty of understanding means adopting a conception of understanding in the broadest sense. That is, nous is our capacity to understand, but it is also our executive function, our capacity for deliberation and decision. These two faces of the mind are clearly distinguished in Aristotle. He often speaks about our having two minds, namely the theoretical mind and the practical mind. Though the distinction drawn between our faculties of perception and the faculty of nous is a harder one, Aristotle's conception of intellection is strikingly similar to his conception of perception. Christopher Shields, a modern philosopher whose summary of Aristotle's psychology is the main source for this article, summarizes the parallel Aristotle draws into anima in the following way. Just as perception involves the reception of a sensible form by a suitably qualified sensory faculty, so thinking involves the reception of an intelligible form by a suitably qualified intellectual faculty. The thread running through both Aristotle's theory of perception and his theory of nous is the idea that in being altered, the relevant faculties become or become similar to the form of the object which affected them. How we should understand the distinction between an object and its form not only requires far more explanation than there is space for here, but is also a source of interpretative controversy among scholars. The distinction between thought and perception is sometimes framed by Aristotle as that between universals and particulars, but elsewhere that distinction is dissolved. 